In mythology and religion, birds usually appear as messengers of the gods, often associated with the journey of the human soul after death. Birds also appear as tricksters and oracles. Tricksters are amongst the most entertaining characters in the world of mythology. They like to break the rules, playing tricks on both humans and gods, operating outside the framework of right and wrong, but often end up revealing some kind of secret knowledge which can benefit mankind. Hermes, called Mercury in Roman mythology, often played the role of trickster in the Olympian pantheon. Loki in Norse mythology was a cunning trickster who had the ability to change his shape and his sex. In many Native American mythologies, the raven spirit stole the fire from the gods sometimes symbolized as stars, moon, or sun, and in Greek mythology, it was Prometheus that stole a burning ember from the gods for people to use. The element of fire in this context was not literal, like for cooking, but a divine element of wisdom and symbolic of the striving individual against the oppressive majority, in this case represented by Jove or Zeus. I've already compared Prometheus to the bird Phoenix, a symbol of rebirth, as well as to the light bearer, or Lucifer, represented by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The Hebrew word for serpent, nakash, is also translated as enchanter and divine, and in esoteric interpretations of the story, such as in the Zohar, plays the role of the trickster that reveals a secret to Adam and Eve which in many ways can be compared to the fire of Prometheus leading to a rebirth as with the phoenix. Of course, the story has been translated and retranslated from its original, which predates the English version in the King James Bible and even the Greek version passed down from Athens. Athens is the capital and largest city of Greece with a recorded history spanning over 3,400 years it's one of the world's oldest cities, which has had a human presence for the entire Holocene. Classical Athens was a powerful city-state, a center for the arts, learning and philosophy, home of Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Temple to Apollo, and is widely referred to as the cradle of Western civilization because of its cultural and political impact on the European continent and in particular, the Romans. The heritage of the classical era is still evident in the city, represented by ancient monuments and works of art, the most famous of all being the Parthenon, a beautiful temple on the Athenian Acropolis dedicated to the goddess Athena, whom the people of Athens considered their patron. Of course, Athens is named after Athena, and the Greeks have a myth for how it got its name. Cecrops, the first king of Attica, had named his city after him, Cecropia. However, the gods of Olympus saw this lovely piece of land and wanted to name it after them and become its patron. The most persistent rivals were Poseidon, the god of the sea, and Athena, the goddess of wisdom. To solve their dispute, Zeus decided that each of them would present a gift to the city and the people of Cecropia would decide which gift was the best and therefore which god would be patron of the city. One sunny day, Cecrops and the residents of the city went up to the high hill to watch the god presenting their gifts. Poseidon was the first to present his gift. He struck a rock with his trident and caused a spring of water to gush forth from the ground. This signified that he was assuring the citizens with water and therefore they wouldn't face any time of drought. However, the people were not exactly enchanted with his gift because the water from the spring tasted salty, 
just like the waters of the sea over which Poseidon ruled. Next, it was the turn of goddess Athena. She struck her spear on the ground, and a lovely olive tree jumped out of the earth. The citizens liked this gift better because it would give them food, oil, and firewood, and this is how Athena became the patroness of the beautiful city, and this is how Athens got its name, according to Greek mythology. The hill where the gods presented their gifts was the Acropolis Hill, and there's still an olive tree there, and some say it's the same tree that Athena gifted to the ancient Athenians. While the olive branch is a famous symbol of peace, the olive tree also represents logic, reason, and rationalization, which are qualities the ancient Greeks revered. The olive tree was the tree of balance by the ancient Celts, and associated with the autumn equinox, or September 23rd, when the day has the same duration as the night, celebrated as Mabon. Dreaming of an olive tree was thought to mean you'll have great happiness. Dreaming of planting one indicates an upcoming marriage. And to dream of eating olives means a happy domestic life. The tree of Athena, the mighty goddess of wisdom, was a symbol of prosperity and abundance, healing and fertility, but also of potency and immortality, as in ancient times, trees were associated with sex and the mysteries surrounding the sacred act. One of the most recognized reenactments of the act of Prometheus stealing the fire from Zeus to bring to humans is the tradition of the Olympic torch ceremony which started in 1936 by Nationalist Germany which hosted the Olympics in Berlin and featured a torch relay from Greece to Germany to convey a connection between the Aryan nation that was emerging in Europe and the ancient Aryans of Greece. 49 nations including the United States came to Berlin for the Nazi Olympics and watched as Aryan athletes followed in the footsteps of the ancient Greeks, bringing fire from Mount Olympus in the first ever Olympic torch relay. The torch run relay was the perfect event for them. Of course, modern academia plays down the Aryan origins of ancient Greece. Even though Greek, like German, is an Indo-European or Aryan language, and much of the classical Greek art is adorned with ancient swastikas similar or identical to the ancient swastikas that adorn ancient Germanic spears, jewelry, and other artifacts such as Viking swords. To understand the common historic origins better, one must look to what came before the Greeks, which is also downplayed or totally neglected by modern post-World War II academia. Greek priests and priestesses often tattooed swastikas on their arms, and later, when the custom of tattooing had disappeared, they put swastikas on their ceremonial garments. The Greeks called the symbol the Gemation, associated it with the cult of Apollo, the sun god, and also the emblem of Zeus, the supreme god visible at night when the sun is down. Of course, the symbol was also very popular among the Romans, who used the swastika as an emblem of Jupiter as their supreme god, as well as the Etruscans, who came before the Romans, and the Minoan civilization, which predated the classical Greeks. But the Minoans did not call themselves Minoan, and history gets murky around this time for anthropologists that refuse to consider the diffusionist reality of the Holocene. Diffusionism refers to the diffusion or transmission of cultural and genetic or ethnic characteristics or traits from a common society to all other societies. 
the ancient Egyptians called them Keftu and said that they dominated the Mediterranean. Pharaoh Narmer, the first king of Egypt, who unified the country at the beginning of the first dynastic period around 3100 BC, stated that Egypt originally was also part of Keftu as well and that they started the reign of the pharaohs with the first seven pharaohs coming from this kingdom, which again was not local but spanned the entire Levant, Mediterranean, and went all the way around Tarshish, which is Spain, up to United Kingdom, where in a prior video I already discussed the Phoenician rule in the Bronze Age and how tin from the UK and the Americas were mined and traded in ancient times. The failure to properly identify and acknowledge the Phoenicians, who also did not call themselves that, and who also revered the swastika symbol, speaks to how academia has been totally subverted by a political agenda. The red-skinned Indians that applied red ochre paint to their bodies, who were genetically related to the Basque, the Phoenicians, early Egyptians, Minoans, Etruscans, and pre-Mycenaeans all share racial and cultural affinities to the ancient Aryan North Iranians or Scythians, which I've also identified with what is biblically known as Israelites. And if we take it back further, who the Egyptians refer to as descendants of the Empire of Atlantis. <music> Olaf Rudbeck the Elder was a Swedish scientist and writer, professor of medicine, and is primarily known for his contributions in human anatomy and linguistics, and is shown here in the 17th century artwork dissecting the world and revealing the secret location of Atlantis, which he believed to be hidden in Sweden. He is surrounded by well-known figures of antiquity, such as Plato, Aristotle, and Homer, and I show it to help illustrate the point that there are many theories for where Atlantis might have been during the Holocene, not limited to Crete, and I contend that they are all ancestors of the original Atlantean Empire, which existed during the Pleistocene, as Plato said it did, located in the Atlantic Ocean, as Plato said it was, and as is depicted here on a map, showing the extent of the Atlantean Empire published in 1882 by American Congressman Ignatius Donnelly in his book Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. While some might find it a bit strange to hypothesize Sweden as a location of Atlantis, one should keep in mind that there are not only linguistic relationships established by some researchers between the Nordic runes and the Phoenician alphabet, but the Viking ships show a striking similarity to Phoenician sea vessels, even down to the serpent symbolism both often had carved onto their boats. That said, recent DNA analysis published in the journal Nature of the genomes of 442 ancient humans from archaeological sites in Scandinavia, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Iceland, Greenland, Estonia, Ukraine, Poland, and other Eastern European countries concluded that the genetic history of Scandinavia was influenced by foreign genes from Asia and Southern Europe before the Viking Age. Many of the mainstream articles ran with this story in an effort to debunk pre-World War II theories, which in a modern political context are regarded as supremacist a term which has come to mean too white. The reality, however, is that ancient Asia and Anatolia is the ancestral homeland of the Aryans, who absolutely were Caucasian, and to a large degree blonde and blue-eyed, 
according to the mummies and remains they left behind, ancient depictions left behind, and ancient writings which describe them. To claim that Thor was sub-Saharan African, as is now the depiction in a new Hollywood movie, or that the Vikings were non-Aryan, is political propaganda. The word Viking comes from the Scandinavian term Vikinger, meaning pirate, and this is a term also given to the ancient Phoenicians, which according to DNA, were genetically regarded as European, as was the DNA of the ancient Minoans. So to say that the Viking DNA, which comes from northern Iran or the steppes of southern Russia, which is Scythian territory, or southern Europe, which is the same thing as saying they were Aryans. That said, the seafaring civilization that dominated the Mediterranean, whether you call them Phoenicians, Minoans, or the Egyptian term Keftu, these people were not the Atlanteans, but descendants of the Atlanteans. Keftu comes down to us as Kaftor in the Bible, and various theories place the island capital as Minoan Crete, Sardinia, the coastline from Tyre northwards to Anatolia, and even Cyprus, according to Emanuel Velikovsky. These are all Holocene locations and civilizations which not only are separated from Plato's Atlantis by many thousands of years, but Plato gave clear directions for the location of Atlantis, which was not in the Mediterranean, but in the Atlantic. Atlantis was not in Scandinavia, which had ancient civilizations that went by different names, you know, such as Hyperborea or Thule, and Atlantis was not a round crater in the Sahara Desert which is a new theory that is probably being disseminated by the same people that are claiming Thor was sub-Saharan. I believe a lot of the confusion would be cleared up when people start to realize that the New World, meaning the Americas, is not new at all, and its history goes back just as far as the history of the Old World. The terms New World and Old World are obsolete, just like the concept that the Americas were named after Amerigo Vespucci. The word Amaruca is derived from the Mayan native god Quetzalcoatl, meaning plumed serpent, and in Peru, this god was called Amaru. The people native to Central America called the territory Amaruca, land of the plumed or feathered serpents. Feathered serpent like the Egyptian and Mesopotamian winged solar symbol, speaks to an ancient global empire which included transatlantic travel stretching back into the era of Cro-Magnon, the Pleistocene or Ice Age, the Antediluvian Age, or the Age of Atlantis. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.